Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Karen Reed? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, then offer my analysis. Karen Reed was born sometime around 1980 and grew up in Taunton, Massachusetts, which is about an hour south of Boston. She attended Bentley University after graduating from high school. In 2001, she earned a bachelor's degree in finance. She went on to earn her master's degree and a PhD in finance from the same school. Karen had a few different jobs. She worked as a faculty member in the Bentley University Finance Department and in other positions related to finance. When Karen was in her 20s, she dated a man named John O'Keefe. Sometime around 2020, the pair reconnected and started dating again. Karen spent most nights at John's house in Canton, Massachusetts. This is about a half hour south of Boston. John O'Keefe was a Boston police officer. He lived with his 14-year-old niece and his 10-year-old nephew. Now moving to the timeline of the alleged crime. On January 29, 2022, at 6.04 a.m., the police received a 911 call reporting that a man named John O'Keefe was found in the snow at 34 Fairview Road. At this time, there was heavy snow and the temperature was in the teens. Emergency responders were dispatched to the scene. They encountered four people, John O'Keefe, Karen Reed, Jennifer McCabe, and Carrie Roberts. John was on the ground. He was cold to the touch and not breathing. He was transported to a hospital where the staff determined that he was deceased. Here's what the police found during their investigation. John O'Keefe died from blunt force trauma. His skull was fractured. Hypothermia also contributed to his death. The police interviewed Jennifer McCabe. She told them that she and some friends arrived at the Waterfall Bar and Grill in Canton, Massachusetts on January 28 at 9 p.m. Karen and John arrived about two hours later. Video surveillance indicated they arrived at 10.54 p.m. In Karen's hand, she was holding a glass that Jennifer believed contained vodka. Throughout the evening, Karen and John seemed to get along well. They did not argue. At around closing time, Everyone in the group of friends was invited back to the residence of a police officer named Brian Albert. His house was located at 34 Fairview Road. This is where John's body would later be discovered. Brian's wife, Nicole, was Jennifer McCabe's sister. Jennifer observed Karen and John leave the bar together. Surveillance video revealed that the couple left at 12.11 a.m., now on January 29. John was carrying a short cocktail glass in his right hand. At 12.14 a.m., Jennifer received a text message from Karen asking, where to? At this time, Jennifer was pulling up to Brian's house. She replied to Karen with the address 34 Fairview Road. Four minutes later, Karen called Jennifer and asked for more specific information about where Brian's house was. From inside Brian's house, Jennifer saw a black SUV that looked like the one that Karen drove pull up to the residence. Karen drove a black 2021 Lexus LX570. Jennifer sent a text message to Karen at 12.31 a.m. with the word, hello. Nine minutes later, Jennifer sent another text message saying, pull up behind me. Jennifer was directing Karen to move off the street to the left side of the property. This is the same side of the property where John's body would later be discovered. At 12.45 a.m., Jennifer once again sent the message, hello. She then watched a black SUV drive away from the house. Presumably, this was Karen's vehicle. At 4.53 a.m., Jennifer received a phone call from John's niece at the direction of Karen. So Karen had John's niece make the call to Jennifer. After Jennifer briefly spoke to the niece, Karen took the phone and told Jennifer she was looking for John. Karen said that she last remembered seeing John at the Waterfall Bar. Karen drove to Jennifer's house 
arriving at about 5.30 a.m. A half hour earlier, Karen had called another friend, Carrie Roberts, and told her that John did not come home. Carrie also made her way to Jennifer's residence and arrived at around the same time as Karen. All three women then went to look for John. They took two vehicles. Jennifer drove Karen's, Lexus, from her house to John's house because Karen was too hysterical to drive. Carrie followed them in her own vehicle. On the trip, Karen said to Jennifer, quote, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? Unquote. She was referring to her boyfriend, John O'Keefe. Karen mentioned how one of her taillights had been damaged. After they arrived at John's house, Karen had Jennifer look at the damaged taillight on the passenger side of the Lexus. The taillight was cracked and missing pieces. At this point, Karen and Jennifer climbed into Carrie's vehicle to continue the search. Carrie was driving, Jennifer was in the passenger seat, and Karen was in the rear seat on the passenger side. As Carrie Roberts pulled onto Fairview Road, going toward Brian Albert's house, Karen Reed said that she saw John O'Keefe. Carrie and Jennifer were confused by this because they didn't see John. Karen exited the vehicle and ran directly to John's body in the snow. His body was 12 feet from the roadway. He had black eyes and there was blood coming from his nose and mouth. Carrie Roberts started performing CPR and Jennifer McCabe called 911. Many elements of Jennifer McCabe's story were corroborated by other witnesses, for example, Carrie Roberts. Paramedics who arrived at the scene said that Karen repeatedly stated, I hit him. The police paid a visit to Karen at 4.30 p.m., over 10 hours after John's body was discovered. She told them that after leaving the Waterfall Bar, she dropped John off at 34 Fairview Road. She then went to his house because she was having stomach problems. She made a three-point turn in order to leave the area of Brian's house. Karen did not see John walk into the house. The police believe that Karen fatally struck John with her SUV. This is what caused the taillight to break. Karen was arrested and charged with manslaughter, motor vehicle homicide, and leaving the scene of an accident causing personal injury and death. Later, she received an upgrade to second-degree murder. At the time making this video, Karen is awaiting trial. The defense has been vigorously promoting various conspiracy theories. Karen has quite a bit of support from the public. Many people believe that the police conspired to cover up the murder of John O'Keefe by framing Karen Reed. Now moving to my analysis. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Karen Reed is guilty of second-degree murder. Starting with the inculpatory factors. Karen was intoxicated during the time of the incident. Her BAC was estimated to be between 0.13% and 0.29%. According to Jennifer McCabe, when Karen had John's niece call her on January 29 at 4.30 a.m., Karen acted like she last remembered seeing John at the Waterfall Bar. Karen only changed her story after Jennifer reminded her that she saw her leave the bar with John. This makes it seem as though Karen was trying to avoid acknowledging that she dropped John off at Brian's house, like she was hoping to distance herself even more from John's movements. Karen claimed that she dropped John off at the Fairview Road residence, but no one at the party saw John enter the house, so it wasn't like he entered the house and then went back out into the snow. According to Carrie Roberts, Karen called her at 5 a.m. During this conversation, Karen said something like, John's dead. I wonder if he's dead. It's snowing. He got hit by a plow. Investigators discovered that the passenger side taillight of Karen's SUV was broken. Some of the red plastic from the taillight was missing, and some clear plastic was missing. The police later found two red plastic pieces and one clear piece of plastic near where John's body was recovered. Both were consistent with the broken taillight of Karen's SUV. In the rear bumper of her Lexus, there were fragments from a broken glass. Fragments were also found near where John's body was discovered. 
Perhaps these fragments were from the short cocktail glass that he was seen carrying when he exited the waterfall bar. Karen left John O'Keefe's house at 5.08 a.m. to start her search. When she did this, she backed into his Chevy SUV with the rear passenger side corner of her Lexus SUV. The contact was made on or near the passenger side taillight, which makes it seem like this is what could have caused the taillight to be damaged. The problem is the police did not find any taillight fragments in the driveway or on the ground at John's house. There is evidence suggesting that the relationship between Karen and John was not going well. John's niece and nephew said that Karen and John argued two or three times a week. John may have been getting ready to end his romantic relationship with Karen. In the week prior to January 29, John told Karen that their relationship had run its course and it wasn't healthy. Text messages on John's phone referred to the relationship as toxic, and there were voicemails on John's phone where Karen screamed at him and said she hated him. Video surveillance at John's house did not capture Karen arriving there after leaving Brian's house, but it did capture her leaving John's house at 5.08 a.m. Karen had access to the surveillance system. Maybe she deleted the video of her arrival. Karen made several comments suggesting that she could have struck John with her vehicle. The backup camera and the audible collision warning signals on Karen's SUV were working properly. Now moving to the exculpatory factors. There were no witnesses to John's death, no video. Karen's defense has suggested that maybe John was killed in a physical altercation. Investigators claim that there was no evidence that John had been in a fight. However, there were six lacerations on his right arm. The police indicated that pieces of plastic consistent with the broken taillight on Karen's SUV were found in the area where John's body was discovered, but these pieces of plastic were found days later. This makes it seem like someone planted these pieces of plastic. Maybe the taillight broke when Karen backed into John's SUV. The police collected those pieces and then put them at the scene where John's body was found. It's possible that Karen struck and killed John, but she did not intend to kill him. So maybe she was the cause of his death, but she didn't mean to do it. It's fairly difficult to reliably commit murder by backing into a person with an SUV. It's not a popular method that killers select. How did the taillight of the SUV make contact with John's head if he was standing up? Perhaps John was intoxicated, fell into a seated position on the ground, and then Karen accidentally backed into him. When considering the evidence, do I believe that Karen is guilty of second-degree murder? I believe she is guilty in reality, but I am not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. In my opinion, Karen is probably guilty of manslaughter. I think the state can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Karen backed into John and killed him when she was intoxicated. Karen was probably angry with John about his desire to end their relationship. She decided to drive the message home and leave him in the cold. Moving to the last section, I want to talk for a moment about the conspiracy theories that have come up in this case. Karen's defense is arguing that Karen never struck John with her Lexus SUV. The taillight was damaged when she backed into his vehicle at his house. They have argued that John must have been beaten to death by one of the partygoers at the house on Fairview Road. Some of these people had connections to law enforcement. This led to the police framing Karen for murder by planting the plastic taillight pieces. To support this theory, Karen's defense has made several arguments based on their interpretation of cell phone data. Here are two examples. The first example, on January 29 at 2.27 a.m., hours before John's body was discovered, Jennifer McCabe's phone was used to search for something like how long to die in the cold. This search was deleted, but the police were able to recover it. The same day, January 29, Jennifer deleted contacts with Brian Albert and his wife Nicole Albert from her phone. The state has refuted these claims about Jennifer's search activity, saying that she did not conduct the search at 2.27 a.m. and she did not delete the contacts from her phone. Moving to the second example, the defense has argued that John's cell phone data 
showed that after arriving at 34 Fairview Road, he walked 80 steps and climbed the equivalent of three floors. The state has refuted these claims as well. They noted that the movement data are unreliable. These same data show that John was moving after his death as well. This seems unlikely, mostly because dead people typically don't move on their own. I think the defense has managed to create some doubt with these conspiracy theories, and they should be permitted to pursue these theories. The state uses cell phone data to convict people all the time. The defense has the right to use it as well. I imagine much of this trial is going to come down to a battle of the technology experts. Now moving to my final thoughts. This case can be summarized in this way. A female finance faculty member found herself in a fervent fling with a law enforcement officer, fueling his fervid farewell while she firmly fancied the flame's future. Following a festive, fuddled night filled with fiery fluids, the feuding couple found themselves fiercely fighting on a frosty freeway during a furious snowstorm. The officer's fate was finalized after his girlfriend fatally finished him with a 4x4 lighting fixture. Those are my thoughts in the case of Karen Reed. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.